Uh, so, um, Rob and I have known each other for, for many, many years. Rob is the director of online teacher education programs at um, the American Museum of Natural History and the National Center for uh, Science, Literacy, Education, and Technology. And his focus is on the design, development, and implementation and evaluation of accessible, innovative, and effective online and blended programs. The museum's partnership with higher education institutions and other education, other organizations have provided cutting edge science to over 6,000 teachers across the United States and the world during the uh, past decade. I am so very pleased that you're here. We're like right in your backyard. I think the museum is walking distance from here. So I'm so glad that you were available and able to join us today. And we're really looking forward uh, to your presentation. Thanks, Rob, for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Alex, and the other organizers uh, for having me here. And thanks to all of you. Um, I'm uh, uh, I have uh, watched with admiration from afar, so, you know, SUNY's uh, incredible uh, uh, growth uh, in, in leadership in online education and, uh, and particularly <laughs> Alex's central role in making that happen all these many years. Although despite the fact that we've known each other for so many years, why is it that I'm the only one who has aged visibly in the process? <laughs> Anyway, it's great to be with all of you. I want to um, try to give you a bit of a flavor for uh, the work that we're doing at the Museum of Natural History in online education. Uh, my own background is as a, a, a researcher in experimental elementary particle physics, and as a college professor, I um, uh, switched over really to online education about 20 years ago. There was online education 20 years ago. We did it on like abacuses and stuff like that. But um, uh, at Teachers College, uh, I, had, I had an opportunity to lead the development of the first online graduate courses there. And, um, and it was really it was very exciting days and, uh, and these remain even, even more exciting days, I think, as our sense of uh, curriculum and instructional strategies and technologies, the incredible uh, mix between what one can do online, what one what can do in person. Um, and I'm just really in awe simply of the things that I've heard over the last day here. And so I really um, salute all of you for your incredible dedication and the high quality um, of your work. Um, the Museum of Natural History is a place I never expected I would end up professionally. Um, I, it's, uh, I used to love to take my kids there when they were young. Uh, we had the dinosaur fries and we loved to wander through the museum. Um, and I'm just curious, how many of you have never been to the Museum of Natural History? Okay, a few. So, <laughs> so if we have time at the uh, end of the day, I'm very happy to lead you over there. And for those of you who have been there, very happy to take you through as well. Um, but you're not allowed to leave before the end of the conference, okay? Um, uh, uh, the, the museum is a big place. It's one of the world's largest natural history museums. Um, it has uh, something like 45 different exhibition halls. Uh, I think one of the things that's really remarkable about it is the, um, the focus on scientific research. Unlike, you know, most uh, informal science institutions. This, it has very large scientific staff, over 200 scientists um, in uh, academic departments, vertebrate and invertebrate zoology, anthropology, paleontology, earth sciences, and so on. Um, and it's been around since 1869. Uh, the, um, and so let me, let me show you a few uh, images of the museum, the Hall of Planet Earth. Of course, we've got the, the blue whale. Um, a, uh, our own uh, rainforest, um, the, the, uh, the um, Rose Center for Earth and Space, and of course dioramas, which is sort of, you know, the internet of the 19th century or so. It's as close as, people, as many people ever got to the scenes of wildlife. Uh, and then these are some of the scientists of yesteryear. Franz Boas, what, what considered one of the real pioneers of modern anthropology. Uh, Margaret Mead, of course. Um, uh, Roy Chapman Andrews, famed dinosaur hunter and director of the museum, I think in the 20s or 30s, and the first discoverer of fossilized 
dinosaur eggs. And you can actually touch, touch a real one. When you come to the museum, this is a scene in the, in, in the uh, Mongolian desert of a car breaking down probably in the 30s. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould, famed ev evolutionary biologist, was at the museum in the 1970s. Um, and then, of course, we have, couldn't forget about Ben Stiller, Night at the Museum. And we became even more popular uh, after that was released. Uh, and then sort of, this is a scene you haven't seen, but you uh, are likely to see sometime over the next several years as a new, our new Gilder Center for Science, Education, and Innovation uh, takes shape on the, uh, on the Western Columbus Avenue side of the museum. And so that's going to be, I think, an incredible space that's going to really increase our capacity for visitors and to add exciting new spaces in e education, exhibition, using uh, uh, forefront technologies. Um, there are a lot of people who really love museums, and I know that there are a lot of people who love the Museum of Natural History. Um, and I don't think it's just the dinosaurs or, or those dinosaur fries or the gift shop. I think that our institution and others um, are able to um, uh, serve the public in terms of their thirst for understanding science and the ability to engage them in science in a way that I think traditionally many higher ed education institutions have not. I think the, um, uh, you know, so if we're talking about museums, aquaria, science centers, botanical gardens, all of these places are sort of uh, low risk places for people to go in and to observe any variety of phenomena, to observe objects, and to have a chance to, um, uh, to uh, begin to under, understand scientific processes and concepts uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that works for them at their own speed without having to worry about a grade or a degree. And I think that the, um, what's impressed me so much, I think, be, be, from my own background in academia, I, I have to be honest, I never thought museums and these science institutions, I thought they were fun, I thought they were great, but I never thought they were, very, they were all that educationally important. And now I realize that I was wrong, uh, that they, I think they have a really critical role to play. I think that the idea of partnerships and collaborations between those formal and informal institutions is, um, is really critical. And so, the, so I hope that later on uh, we have a chance to discuss either in a group or individually uh, the ways in which we may be able to collaborate going forward. Um, for our, most of our work does focus on science education in particular, and that's been particularly informed over the last several years by the development of the next generation science standards, which I suspect uh, many of you are familiar with. And so that I think really um, gives us uh, is, is sort of a, um, a, a new approach to science education, or at least an evolved approach uh, compared to what we've had. And I think it really emphasizes the idea that science is as, as uh, science does. And so if we want people to develop uh, uh, an understanding of science and what it means to do science, then we need to give them uh, practice. Yeah, in, in science, and we need to emphasize the, those core scientific practices like asking questions, designing models, using mathematical thinking, analyzing data, and so on. And so with that, we, we want to in, in, intertwine that with those core disciplinary ideas about what we know, the specific uh, concepts in, in, across the sciences, as well as um, cross-cutting concepts, things like patterns and size and stability and change and so on. And so we think that that is a, um, a more leavened, um, maybe, you know, uh, uh, means of sort of uh, moving beyond what has traditionally been sort of the mile-wide, inch-deep approach to science education. And so that is a work in progress for us as we uh, take some of our uh, past programs and try to incorporate these ideas and develop new ones as well. So there is an awful lot going on at the museum, uh, far more than I can tell you about, it, both in terms of in-person programs, online programs, digital resources. But I want to at least call your attention to uh, four here. 
that I think are worth knowing about. One is simply our general website, amnh.org, the central repository for uh, uh, everything going on at the museum. Seminars on Science is our online uh, teacher professional development program that I'll be talking about at some length. Um, Science Bulletins is a great website that features uh, uh, short videos, seven or eight minute videos on current research and recent discoveries across the sciences, uh, great for classroom use. And then Ology is a great we uh, website for kids uh, age seven and up, also a great resource for uh, younger kids. Um, but, but for the next several minutes, I'd like to focus on seminars on science. That is the flagship program of online um, uh, teacher education at the museum. It's been around, these, it's a set of online graduate courses, uh, 12, so you can see the entire catalog on one PowerPoint slide here. Um, and, um, uh, um, and, and those courses are actually online graduate courses uh, with typically 15 to 30 people in a course. They are exclusively for either current or future teachers. They are team taught, and um, the current price, the retail price is 545, but there is lots of flexibility, especially in terms of partnerships. That doesn't include the cost of graduate credit, sorry. Um, let me, we, we recently have just put together a, a promotional video, and so it's, 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 it's still a bit of a rough cut, so you'll ex you have to excuse the imperfections. And I can't tell you how much, how cringeworthy it is for me to have to actually watch myself on this video, but there you have it. So let me, this is just a couple of minutes, I'll just play this for you. Many people know about the American Museum of Natural History. They know it has incredible dinosaurs and gems and minerals and so on. But I don't know how many people are aware that there's an incredible scientific research staff here. Our seminars on science online graduate courses really bring all of this and more to teachers across the United States and around the world. There are so many different courses you could take. Ocean systems. The link between dinosaurs and birds. Solar system. Space, time, and motion. The earth inside and out. The diversity of fishes. There's videos, there's essays. An important aspect of seminars on science is this connection to real scientists. Through the seminars on science course, you'll have exposure to a lot of rich resources from um, great institutions like Howard Hughes Medical Institute and NASA. I took the courses to deepen my own understanding of science content. Coming from a history background, I wanted to be more confident in the classroom with my students. Our discussions are structured in a way where you can check in throughout a two-week period for each new question. You are in discussion with your peers who are teachers from across the country. You can come back when you have time available. If you need to run off to work, if you need to make dinner for your family. The courses are available for graduate credit from several of our partners. I have lots of comments all the time about how much people have enjoyed our courses and how much they're so eager to be able to transmit that enthusiasm to their students. These are courses that are not only about uh, exciting science at the cutting edge, but also about how you can bring that science into the classroom. There's a reason I'm not going to be at the Oscar ceremony this Sunday. <laughs> okay, so a little more specifically, seminars on science. Our, our goal here is to improve teacher content knowledge in science. These are fundamentally content courses, but with important classroom connections. We provide uh, discussion questions, uh, re digital resources, and um, and participants construct a final project, which is a set of lesson plans uh, based on the science in this course that they can then implement in the classroom. So they are, uh, they are content courses. New York State recognizes them as, as graduate content courses. Uh, we, in case you're wondering, that graduate credit comes from partners that I'll uh, uh, talk a little about later. Um, and if you have questions throughout, please just feel free to, to interrupt. Um, and so, um, and the, the, the courses are based upon what we know works well in, in, in terms of uh, connecting uh, scientists with teachers, providing a, a networked community of instructors, providing powerful content resources, providing opportunities for reflection, and so on. Um, and 
Um, and so that is what we're doing. Uh, these are some of those 200 scientists at the museum. Um, the, uh, you, may not typically, you may not typically see them working when you visit. Only about 25% of the uh, museum space is actually publicly accessible space. Um, and there, so there are a lot of laboratories and collections and so on going on. Um, and there is a whole academic structure to the museum. There are, in fact, we, we actually are a higher ed institution. Uh, we, the Richard Gilder Graduate School has been going on for about 10 years. We have a doctoral program in comparative biology. And uh, we also now have a Master of Arts in Teaching Earth Science uh, program as well. So it's a very exciting place to be. The, course, the courses, the seminars and science courses are six weeks long. Um, they are um, authored by museum scientists working with the National Center for Science Literacy, Education, Technology, uh, the center that I am part of, and that includes essentially uh, set, set, uh, educators, professional development, uh, t professional developers, writers, uh, HTML programmers, and so on. And so we really have a, um, a core group that's able to work on various web-based digital projects. Um, and so we work with, so the uh, scientists are the basic authors of the course, but we work with them to create, help create a very rich experience. Um, the instructional team, I think, if there's one thing to take away from, uh, uh, from this talk, it's that we think that we have very powerful instructional team. The, the instructional model is that we have uh, an educator along with a scientist. And so that instructional team then is able to support those 15 to 30 uh, participants in the course with, a, with what we think is a powerful combination of scientific content expertise as well as classroom application. If we have more than 23 people in a course, then we'll add a teaching assistant as well. So the student-teacher ratio is pretty good in these courses. And um, I showed you a glimpse of the scientists a few slides ago. These are actually our online instructors, along with several of my uh, colleagues at the museum. We actually had our first instructors conference where we brought people together um, uh, just uh, uh, last month. And it was a fantastic session. It was great to actually have a chance to meet people that we had only seen as thumbnails or talked to um, uh, or, or, or had desktop video conferencing with. And so we had a very uh, action-packed two and a half days where we had a chance to talk about rubrics and grading standards and Turnitin and all sorts of things. Um, much of the courses are really centered around essential questions, uh, such as the ones that you see here in front of you. Those are examples of the kinds of discussion questions that we have on a weekly basis. And we, um, we do, re the, the discussion forums are about 40% of a student's grade, and so it's important for them to participate. We um, spend a lot of time preparing our instructors and scientists uh, how, to, how to moderate a discussion forum. Um, let, so, we, so among those 12 courses, uh, one of my own personal favorites is evolution. And that's one that I wanted to actually have a chance to step in and show you, show you a bit about now. Okay. So evolution is. Um, was um, was co-authored by Niles Eldridge, who worked with Stephen Jay Gould, as well as uh, who's a paleontologist, as well as uh, Joel Craycraft, an uh, ornithologist at the museum. Let's see. I'm just trying to get my mouse here. Okay. We can do this. Okay, so this is the home page of the course, and so as uh, students come in, then they, they, have a sh they can see the various um, news on the right-hand side and a calendar, but um, 
Uh, and so, so I think that the general structure of this, I suspect, is fairly familiar to most of you. Uh, there, we have an introductory video on the introduction to the courses. I'm going to skip past that now. The, um, and then we have uh, course faculty. And so, for example, let's see. Oops, that's not quite what I wanted. Um, let's see. Anyway, proceeding down there, so there are bio, bios of the instructors. Um, in this case, there's a te teaching assistant as well. There's a textbook. In this case, this is one that's a free download. Um, but uh, although I think the OER is wonderful and I hope we will uh, move toward there, uh, many of our textbooks still do cost money. Um, and then you have the weekly content. And so you can get a sense for how this course is organized and sort of what the essential questions are in this case. Um, so this is, this is week one. What's the evidence for evolution? Uh, you have the authoring scientists here. Um, and there is an icebreaker forum that's common to the first week of all of our courses where uh, the participants have a chance to introduce themselves. The, um, the essays are, um, are central to the course, and so here's an example of an essay uh, on the evolution of life on Earth from one of the scientists. Um, that's a fairly short one. And let's see. Unfortunately, I'm having a little bit of trouble here. Um, so I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. And so um, this is an example of discussion forum. Here I'm actually jumping to our uh, course on space, time, and motion. And this gives, I don't know how well you can read this, but, um, but this is, what, what it shows is a discussion forum happening with a scientist and an instructor and one of the participants. And they are talking about the, the instructor, the, uh, the other participant is talking about uh, you know, the idea of elite seconds. Oh, thank you. Okay, great. Um, the, um, the discussion is really central to our courses. Um, it's where we think a lot of the learning takes place. Uh, my colleague, uh, Dave Randall, um, uh, uh, who, got his, who did his uh, dissertation research on these discussion posts, um, uh, concluded that the uh, using the community of inquiry framework, uh, which of course, you know, and we are, the, the Peter Shea fan club has a very strong presence at the Museum of Natural History. Um, uh, uh, and so I, uh, I, I, I'm not going to say much here, but the, um, but uh, Dave, Dave concluded that, um, uh, that the, when those discussion posts were analyzed for cognitive presence, which is, you know, my sense is this is the level of presence just below problem solving, that um, that their high levels of integration were found so that people were 
uh, the participants did a, 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 in general a very good job in terms of integrating the content that was in those courses into the discussion, which is something that they were explicitly asked to do by the rubrics uh, uh, in the course. Uh, and so, uh, as Dave says, the, the reinforces reports from previous literature that the online environment is conducive to reflective and careful contributions by participants. But um, uh, last night in an email, Dave asked me to emphasize that the literature has, 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 uh, has, has proceeded since then, and so this doesn't ref may not reflect the latest findings. But I think it's encouraging in terms of what's going on in our classes. Um, we have other courses as well, one on genetics, genomics, and genetics, um, looking at the human genome, the ethical implications, the l newest technologies, and so on. Um, and so this is a, a course page from that course, a course on Earth inside and out, um, that, ta that about the history of the Earth, the dynamics of the Earth, climate change, um, and uh, and of course not only for all of these courses uh, our current understandings, but how we know what we know. So looking you know inter you know looking at scient scientific instrumentation, research methods, and so on. Another course on the ocean system, in which we have a, an interactive called a find event uh, uh, that lets participants uh, try to discover hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, uh, you know, these remarkable um, structures where we think w in which you have superheated water boiling into the freezing uh, ocean water and or the nearly frozen ocean water and um, and you, you have the uh, life evolving in very strange forms because of the uh, chemical uh, um, energy that they're deriving. So in order to discover these amazing structures, uh, you use a, uh, a probe that looks at conductivity, um, temperature, density, and you have to do that from the surface. And so you're looking for very tiny variations in these quantities. And so, um, and so you have this... Um, this uh, plumb line that is, is dropped from a ship that, that we have a whole simulation for and people have a chance to sort of look at the temperature variations and then re refine the trajectory of that line. And I won't try to explain it all to you here, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, this one, this particular one is available uh, uh, for free uh, off of our website. And so, um, and so I'd encourage you to, to take a look under our curriculum collections uh, if interested. Space, time, and motion is particularly near and dear to my heart um, the, uh, because of the, uh, uh, the physics interest. It's really based upon a, an, uh, an exhibit on I the science and life of Albert Einstein that took place uh, some years ago at the museum. And so this is really looking at key concepts like what is motion, what is time, what is space, and so on. Let's see if I can manage to play a video here. See the various essays that we have, and here is a video that might be kind of fun. Everything moves. Everything. And motion is just manifestation of going from one spot in space to another spot in space. When we're trying to understand motion, all of the things that we measure from have to come from an inertial frame of reference. An inertial frame of reference is a reference frame that's moving at a constant speed and not changing direction. Let's say you're riding on a train and it's going 20 miles an hour. This is the 59th Street subway. Let's say you throw an orange forward at 20 miles an hour. Now, to you, the orange is going 20 miles an hour. But to someone standing on the side of the tracks, the orange is going 40 miles an hour. That's Galilean relativity. According to Galilean relativity, every speed can add with every other speed in any frame of reference. But the speed of light, it turns out, doesn't add. 
The Michelson-Morley experiment showed that the speed of light could be constant no matter what direction you moved. Albert Einstein is the first person to assume the speed of light is constant for any observer. So Galilean relativity breaks down. It's wrong when you're trying to measure things traveling at or near the speed of light. When Einstein accepted that the speed of light is constant for any observer, he worked out the mathematical equations from that assumption. And he found out that the consequences were that when you have motion through space, then you move more slowly through time. Lengths get shorter, mass increases, clocks run slower when you move. Motion changes our perception of time and space. So that's, uh, that one's a few years old, but I just, uh, it's a personal favorite of mine. Um, the, um, uh, we have other courses. Of course, we have to have a course on dinosaurs. Uh, this Mark Norell is the, um, the head of paleontology. He was featured, you saw, short, saw a short clip of him in that promotional video. Uh, the Solar System, uh, authored by, co-authored by Neil deGrasse Tyson and Denton Abel. It's a new take on the solar system um, uh, that covers the, uh, the, the development of the solar system, how those inner rocky planets are different from the large gaseous ones, the search for life uh, in the universe by looking in the solar system, and, and so on. Um, the, uh, I, I, unfortunately, I can't show you, but there's a great video that we're able, of, of Robert Redford uh, take, you know, uh, 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 narrating the solar wind with great graphics. Um, and it's like, you know, I think it's one of the great things about, um, uh, about my job is that I'm able to skim the cream off, I think, just some of the most incredible uh, talent uh, and graphics and all of it to leverage everything, you know, all the, um, the media and the science and the education from across the museum uh, in order to um, uh, create what we hope are very powerful educational experiences for teachers. Uh, we have a scale model of the solar system that people do in Google Maps. Um, uh, similarly, we use Google Maps to, uh, for participants to be able to uh, uh, chart their local watersheds, to write up some information and to be able to share that with the rest of the class. We have a course on the brain. Um, I'll, I'm going to skip these, just time-wise. And then we have a final project, which is uh, the synthesizing project where people create, as I said, a set of lesson plans that they can uh, utilize in the course with uh, well-defined uh, rubrics. People know what is required and what they're being graded on. Uh, there's an example of our rubric, which I'm certainly not going to try to read to you now. Okay, partnerships. We have partnerships in higher education with uh, not currently nine um, colleges and universities that provide graduate credit for the course. Um, they, some of them um, have their, you know, including uh, um, City University of New York, uh, send their, uh, their own graduate students to our courses. Others, um, well, all of them do that at some level, but uh, uh, others also um, uh, provide graduate credit for non-matriculated students, I think, you know, partly in the hopes of attracting them into their own degree programs. We also have a marketing partnership with the National Science Teachers Association, um, and, we ha and we also are a professional development provider for uh, international baccalaureate. And so we offer online courses and also uh, blended offerings to IB. Um, an independent evaluation of the courses has been done by Inverness Research Associates for the last 18 years. At just high level, what people come away with is that, um, is that um, uh, these are self-reported results, but at that, but that you know, at, at the sort of 80% level or so, uh, teachers report that uh, as a result of these courses, they deepen their scientific understandings, they deepen their understanding of the process of scientific inquiry, they acquire useful new classroom resources in terms of those, the, in terms of videos and media, discussion questions, assignments that they can um, uh, adapt for their own class, and about 80% actually prefer it to locally available professional development opportunities. Um, if you dive in a little deeper, then you see that um, 
uh, teachers report that taking these courses actually strengthens their relationship to their discipline in the various ways that you see in front of you. They also are able to apply the knowledge that they learn in these courses to the classroom. And they utilize the course resources in the classroom. So we go back to them several months after they've taken the class and where our, our evaluators do, and they um, interview them. And these are just some comments from uh, some of our per happier participants. And so they, they appreciate the resources, they appreciate the nature of online discussion, and uh, the resources again. Okay, in addition to seminars, so that's so much for seminars on science. Those are smaller, interactive uh, uh, courses, 15 to 30 students. We have um, maybe um, uh, 50 or so set courses, offerings a year with, you know, typically about 20 Five people per course. We've also, over the last several years, gotten into MOOCs. Um, and so we, uh, uh, starting this month, actually, we will have, I guess, five or six MOOCs uh, in addition to the ones that you see in front of you here on genetics and society, the dynamic earth and evolution. We have, a, we'll, we'll roll out other ones on, um, on stem cells and ecology. Um, in general, the um, I think that most of you are familiar with MOOCs, and so I'm not going to say too much. Um, we've had uh, something like 200,000 enrollments uh, in, in these MOOCs since we first began in 2013. But as you know, 200,000 isn't what it used to be. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the completion rate for our courses is not very much different from others, and so that's at the level of maybe 4, four or 5 or 6 percent. Um, nevertheless, you know, what we have found is that 90% um, uh, of the people who are taking these courses have never heard of the Museum of Natural History. It's there, you know, we've got them in more than 200 countries. And so just as a means of increasing awareness of the museum and of its role in, in education, it's helpful. I'm going to skip over um, uh, most of these, which are just sort of show you details about what's in the MOOCs. Um, uh, of course, because the MOOCs uh, have much larger enrollments, typically hundreds or thousands, um, um, in our courses more typically hundreds these days, I would say, the, um, um, uh, we are n we're not able to provide, of course, the same level of interactivity. They're essentially, for us, uh, self-guided courses. Um, I think that I'm very interested in trying to per explore, and maybe some of you um, uh, uh, can help. Um, to sort of see how we could provide greater interactivity, greater sense of connection, um, a, a deeper experience for these courses. Um, then there's blended learning. And so, uh, we know one interesting thing is that while many courses start off in person and then one develops an online version of them, in our case, these our seminars on science courses were born online and uh, over, the, over the course of several years, you know, we realized we have a ama pretty amazing physical space at the museum there, and uh, maybe we could combine and see what, what is possible. Um, I'm sure you all know the pros and cons about doing so, um, but, um, but we have, have done a number of um, uh, ventures into blended learning, uh, beginning with seminars on science itself, taking pieces of some of courses, say two or three weeks of a course, maybe putting one of the one one week um, one one modules worth uh, in front of an in-person session, and then additional modules afterward. Typically, our model has been to focus on the scientific content online, and then classroom practice and applications, and uh, mu and and taking advantage of the physical museum resources in person. Um, we've also done. Um, what I have called multi-institutional blended offerings, or MIBOs, although I can't say that that acronym has really caught on. Um, and, and so uh, in 2010, the uh, Museum of Natural History and the Metropolitan Museum of Art collaborated on a teacher workshop called Art, Science, and Inquiry, um, in which we brought, um, I think, probably about 20 teachers or so together for um, 
uh, something like a three-week online session that included a day at the Met as well as a day at the Museum of Natural History. We had curators from both institutions. We had tours from both places. We had synchronous and asynchronous online activity as well. And so it was, um, it just about killed us, I think, uh, in terms of organizing it. And I think that, you know, those of you who have been involved with blended uh, learning, I suspect, uh, you know, have the, you know, can share your own war stories in terms of the logistical challenges. Um, but it was enormously fun, and I think it was quite creative, and, um, and we enjoyed it a lot. Uh, so much so that the following year, we actually uh, expanded this offering and included um, the um, uh, two, uh, the California Academy of Sciences and the De Young Museum in San Francisco uh, to further uh, 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 as a follow-up, and that was great. We also did um, with um, uh, another, with uh, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and the, San, the Exploratorium in San Francisco, a blended, multi-institutional blended version of the brain uh, based upon the, se the seminars on science course that was being created at that time, and again, featuring a mix of online and on-site efforts. And so uh, we actually, uh, we had the, the in-person sessions were actually coordinated to be in, in, at the same uh, uh, time, and so we actually had synchronous connections between the Museum of Natural History, Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and the Exploratorium, and so you can sort of see um, examples of people, what people were doing in each of those settings, and then we, and, and this is a, um, 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 a, a video uh, conference that we had of one of our researchers talking to all three sites at once. You can actually see the, the camera uh, in the, um, on the right side of the, muse of the New York, uh, the museum visit. And, and this, these are examples of what uh, the feedback for that particular multi, uh, the brain offering. And so, um, you know, people uh, appreciated being um, connected to other learners and, um, and, and they appreciated knowing that there are similar problems in other parts of the country if you're a teacher and, um, and they just thought, thought there was a certain coolness to it. Okay, finally, partnerships. Um, um, these are our current partners. I think that, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get right to the chase. I think that SUNY is just doing some remarkable things. I would love to explore the ways in which we might be able to work together. Um, both the museum and SUNY um, have New York State as sort of a central focus. Um, we have our Master of Arts in Teaching Earth Science is about increasing the avail the supply of earth science teachers to New York State. Um, but just in general, I think, be, beyond even that, that sort of shared sense of, of locus, um, I just think there is a, a lot going on, a lot of potential um, collaboration and complementarity. And so it would be fun to explore either for your teacher, your teacher education programs um, or beyond what, what kinds of synergies there might be. Um, um, and I think that maybe with a few minutes that remain, maybe I'll just end there and, and uh, see if you have comments or, or any questions. Comments and questions for Rob? Peter? Rob, I thought it was a, this a fascinating presentation about and the integration of the work of the museum for education of teachers, especially. I thought was interesting, and I think one of the comments that you made about um, evaluating teachers' understanding or your students' understanding of scientific and they're measuring their sort of discourse is scientifically accurate is an, an excellent example of. Uh, a th like a theory-based foundation for doing additional research. So you are you have implicit in there a, a, a theory of learning that is a scientifically uh, community-based theory where 
we know that there are certain concepts and kinds of discourse that scientists engage in, and you're, what you're trying to do is get learners to appropriate the language and the norms and the conventions of scientists, and there's measurable behaviors that are evident in the discourse that students leave in these online courses that can help inform our understanding of how people learn, how people learn online, and how people learn science. So I think it's just really a fascinating and very uh, richly potential uh, opportunity for understanding a lot of things, including learning in informal envi informal environments. It's, it's, it's terrific. Thanks. Thanks very much. Really appreciate that. I hope I'm doing this right. I was curious because you made mention a few times of OERs in uh, your the, the museum's online courses and such. Does the museum have a bank of OER resources that uh, many of our universities, colleges can uh, access and utilize? Even things like I'm uh, starting to get interested in virtual field trips with online learning. Uh, is there uh, is the museum an excellent resource for things like that? Um, well, you, you know, depending, I guess, on how you define OER, but what, what I know is that we certainly do have quite a vast array of freely available digital resources, um, uh, and uh, and and so um, those can all be found on the AMNH website. And in particular, if you go to the Learn and Teach tab and you go to Curriculum Connections, then you'll find a number of, of resources, whether in Climate Interactive, um, the five tools for uh, next generation science standards, um, all, uh, 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 Ology is a, a separate website, uh, uh, you know, within the museums. But and I'm happy to talk to you afterwards and give you give you give you a list. But I think there's quite a bit going on. But the um, but whether but what but the um, um, you know whether they are structured in a way that can be easily um, accessed and transferred or you know fit within what you, what you might think of as OER, I'm not sure we'd have to talk. Yeah. Yes. Hi. I'm interested if you could um, maybe mention, have any of the uh, partnerships that you've described, maybe even with those uh, with the colleges and universities, have they been involved in the MOOC development? And if so, can you describe a little bit of that process? How did that work? Um, some of our campuses, we wouldn't be able to come here to New York City as easily. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. kind of partnership might be a really good thing to explore. Yeah, it's a it's a fascinating idea. The um, I think the, the truth is that in general, <clears throat> the museum has, has developed its own content, um, has not co-developed typically with partners, but that doesn't mean there isn't a great opportunity for doing that going forward. Um, the, um, uh, the, our, our, our newest seminars on science course, Ecology, is one that, that heavily utilizes the resources of Howard Hughes Medical Institute, HHMI, and so that was, um, pretty much a co-development, actually, and so, uh, and that's I think about the furthest we've gotten. So, in general, the the higher ed institutions, um, we have, uh, they've attached graduate credit for the courses. But sometimes we have uh, collaborated on grant proposals that the the university has uh, wanted to, uh, for which the, the university has wanted uh, our programs to support uh, them. Um, but not so much, but I think I, I would love to, uh, to, to pursue that possibility. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, on that topic, um, we rec recently went to see Dark Matter and the Birds in Flight. Phenomenal. Oh, thank you. Has that been bridged to new types of pathways of careers and collaborations? Because you do have partners <coughs> that helped build that. Is that part of your MOOC and how you make the science the content tying into the real world context and how maybe somebody who's more artistic might approach science because that is a science, uh, artistic way of looking at the science, right? The dark matter and mm -hmm. the birds in mm -hmm. flight. Has that been bridged as far as that process and how that might tie into the youth, um, the educators moving forward? 
I, I'm sorry, I, I just, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. So the process of developing and creating dark matter in birds in flight takes a lot of people, thousands of hours, a lot of expertise, a lot of creativity, and the science, scientists and the educational, I mean, it's the whole package. Has that been translated into anything that somebody who's interested in getting into that field could find a pathway to find out more about getting into that field, being that you do it at such a wonderful level? Mm -hmm. that, it's a great question, and, um, and I don't know the answer to that. Not, I am not aware uh, that that's been done, but it doesn't mean it hasn't been. But it's, 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 you're right, there's a great opportunity there. Yeah. Yes. Hi. I'm Director of Online Learning at the Fashion Institute of Technology. So we're looking at doing a lot of our art and design courses now in the blended format. And I was really interested to hear what you had to say about kind of weaving the online environment to your resources that you have for in person. And just wondering if you could expand a little on any challenges you face with that or what was the most mm -hmm. interesting. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I, I talked with um, Jose Diaz, uh, uh, who was uh, from FIT, who was here yesterday. Um, the, um, um, I think that the, uh, you know, you have to worry about catering and about heating <laughs> and about getting people in and, and just all the usual stuff, all the logistics of in-person uh, in um, uh, offering. And I think that the truth is that for the examples that I've mentioned, um, you know, with the uh, co collaboration with the Met, and with the other science institutions, those were very ambitious efforts, and there was synchronization among multiple institutions. I think that for simply uh, a blended uh, course, um, I think for us it worked pretty well, and I think that we really felt with that we did get kind of the best of both worlds, and, and I don't think there were any um, really terrible challenges in terms of the organizing, and especially if it's something you do on a regular basis. But it's just that, you know, I've come to appreciate the how, how, how wonderful from an administrative standpoint asynchronous online education can be. <laughs> Anything else for Rob? Okay, I think Rob is going to be with us uh, today and tomorrow. And so I know that he's looking um, to talk to folks about potential um, partnerships and collaborations. And so I hope that you're interested that we'll see Kim out during the next uh, couple of days. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you very much.